you know, looking at the addiction and looking at the efforts that are out there, law enforcement, there's so many different perspectives and looking at it from a juvenile's point of view uh, versus an adult's point of view obviously gives us a lot to think about and how we go. I wanted to just welcome everybody and happy afternoon on a Sunday and just wanted to thank Christ Church for having this event and the awareness that it presents. And thanks to Kevin as well, Father uh, Kevin and everybody for what, what you've done and those who've made this possible and all the partners. I'd like to ask real quick though, I noticed a lot of uh, my friends from the Drug Free Coalition here. If I could have all of you stand for a second for Drug Free Coalition. Warren Wright, <laughs> Commissioner Moran, Tom Beery. I even saw Catherine Hager back there. Those are the rocks that I lean on in law enforcement because the Drug Free Coalition has been around for a long time in this county and is a great partner to all of us. Um, and I'm glad to see them here and appreciate uh, what they're doing. All right, just to cut right into this, everyone's asking why I have hair. So I've gotten like five people have asked me today, why are you growing your hair out? Um, because my wife said I couldn't. So just to get that out of the way, uh, every, every weekend she asked me, uh, she said Kim's Barbershop opens at 8.30 and I'm being very defiant on this. So we'll see where this goes. But since 1997, I think I haven't had hair. So I just figured I'd get that out of the way before that question comes up here to the mic. So I want to give you my perspective in law enforcement from what I see. And I'm going to be very honest with you and give you my opinions. I'm going to give you some facts. And I'm going to give you my 30 plus years of law enforcement experience and how I've seen this drug epidemic uh, evolve throughout our county. But what's unique about today is this is a puzzle. You have one piece, my perspective, Mr. Kenneth's perspective, Kevin's, and everybody's together, which hopefully will give all of us that are sitting here today a very clear picture of the drug epidemic that's occurring nationally, across the world, and here in Queen Anne's County. Queen Anne's County is one big community, and I'll tell you whether we have a hurricane, a tornado, anything, everybody comes together. So it's good to see everybody here today because together, putting our arms together, we can actually make a difference with this. And I'm very pleased with uh, everyone who came here. One thing I can say is there's not one person in this county that has not been touched by somebody who has lost their life to an opioid overdose or death, that's, everybody's been touched by that. This whole community has been touched. One common thread is something that someone did that has affected all of our lives. I'd like to talk real quick about the history of the opioid epidemic. When I was growing up as a kid, I remember my parents showing me in the 1970s a picture of a guy laying in the gutter in an alleyway, most likely Baltimore, Washington DC, or New York, or something like that, with a needle in the arm as kind of a scare tactic to say, hey, if you drew drugs, this is what's gonna happen to you. But that was a needle that they were showing us. Who would have thought here in 2020, we'd be talking about the start being a pill or being something that someone can add to something that we're taking. The 1980s, we went through those days of, uh, I guess it was Miami Vice and the cocaine epidemic that went through. and. And that kind of plague, you know, it looked glamorous and we saw the Hollywood movies that were out there about this and the efforts from law enforcement in the boats chasing people down through Miami and all this and TV shows were made about it. But with the cocaine that was out there, what crept into our communities in the 1980s and early 90s was something we didn't expect, which was crack cocaine. Crack cocaine crept into our communities and it was cheap. It wasn't the $100 a gram that the rich guys or girls were paying for a gram of powdered cocaine. It was that $10 rock, that $10 rock of crack. And I can remember in law enforcement finding, you'd pull a car over, you'd find a beer can that was crushed, and you'd look at it and you'd be like, why is there a beer can that's crushed? And you looked at little holes in it, and that person was already starting to and was addicted to something that uh, we weren't even familiar with in the mid-'80s early 90s, and that was the crack cocaine epidemic. In the 2000s, law enforcement really aggressively attacked the uh, cocaine distribution lines. We attacked the crack epidemic as best we could. And then we started to see more and more prevalent marijuana, which had been back in the 1960s, come back in the cycle. 
marijuana started to come back into play. And everyone says, oh, it's just weed, it's just marijuana. Well, when I grew up in the 80s, everyone I knew that smoked marijuana is still living in their mother's basement smoking marijuana. All my friends that did it are still there. They're calling their moms, bringing down dinner to them, and they're still hanging out in the basement. I didn't see anything productive with that. And here we are in the 2000s now, legalizing or talking about the legalization of marijuana. I am, have no idea if it serves any medicinal purpose. And if it does, like opiates, then it has a place. But being used and abused um, and for sale on the street and stuff is helping fuel the addiction process. Mr. Kenna talked about the desire to try the cigarette, alcohol, vaping as a segue. It's the marijuana after that. We're seeing it's chasing that high something else or something that a lot of our kids are being exposed to is somebody walking up saying, hey, just try this. Just try it once. It won't hurt you. But it's that one time that that person becomes addicted to that substance. We talked about mental health and things like that, which we'll talk about more. But the one thing I wanted to also bring up to you is border security. And this isn't a political discussion about securing our borders and things like that. But all of the fentanyl and all of the drugs and stuff are openly coming through our borders, whether it's through a mule, whether it's through the Postal Service or something like that. So in law enforcement, we've got to really step up our game working with authorities to stop this stuff before we can get a handle on the addiction, stop this stuff from coming into our borders and into our country, because it's killing a lot of people. Opiates have been around forever. Um, they have actually were used, they were legal uh, in 1775 all the way through 1914, believe it or not. We've heard that Coca-Cola had opiates in it. Uh, opiates were used to treat soldiers in the war. And then opiates became illegal to be sold on the street and had to be regulated in 1914. And they still are, to, still are today with that. 2017, the reason I brought the Drug-Free Coalition up earlier was 2017, the Health Department, the Drug-Free Coalition, Dr. Ciatola, we saw this huge epidemic creeping in around Queen Anne's County. And that was the fentanyl and the heroin. Many other jurisdictions, Cecil County, places in Delaware, it was kind of just like this, just starting to creep around Queen Anne's County. We knew it would be here. We knew it was coming. So we had to declare a kind of a war on the opiates and a war on the substances coming in. The overdoses, we knew were gonna be here. We knew they were gonna start to hit Queen Anne's County. We had to come up with a plan, a plan for at least letting the public know, we started a very heavy campaign in 2017 of talking about the opiates that were out there and that they were coming into our community. And darn if they didn't, almost that year we started to see opioids and opioid deaths just go through the roof. Mr. McKenna talked about the drug trends that the parents see with the kids and the vaping. Um, the children out there are getting inundated with these ads like you talked about on social media. You can even buy the pills and stuff on social media. People go out there and drug dealers will deliver to you now. Just search, if they search a pill, the drug dealers out there on social media will find you, uh, will hook up with you. And what we're seeing is a lot of synthetic pills that are out there are containing uh, grams or small amounts of fentanyl in those. Most people's best network are their friends. And that was talked about earlier with making sure that we, Mr. Kevin talked about getting away from those persons that are gonna take you down that path and changing your behavior as, with that. Treatment, denial, and death. Treatment, I believe, is, is one of the most important things that we can offer people. The problem is most people out there go through denial that they have an addiction problem. And then what we're seeing is the result that all of us are affected by is the death of that person. Overdoses in Queen Anne's County, I know this is hard to see. 2000 and, 2021, we had 11 fatal overdoses and 43 actual non-fatal overdoses. Coming off of 2018, we had 16 fatal and 122 
non-fatal overdoses. As of March 1st, I'm sorry, as of March of 2022, we've had one fatal overdose and six um, overdoses. Earlier was brought up by Kevin talking about Narcan. The thing that really skews our numbers with some of these overdoses is, in a good way, everyone can get Narcan. I know one family that has probably narcan one of their children nine times. And of those nine times, possibly only two or three times, EMS has been summoned to assist with that. Narcan's a great tool. Law enforcement officers are out there, the community has it, and it does save a life. But we, we really encourage anyone who's deployed Narcan or used Narcan to please get that person to a hospital so that they can be evaluated because the Narcan wears off after 30 minutes or so. And when that Narcan wears off, that person, if they were high enough on that or had ingested fentanyl or, or a large amount of heroin, they could go right back into another overdose situation. And that's what we've seen in Queen Anne's County. Overdoses by age. This is alarming. They're starting out early with the cigarettes, the alcohol, the vape pens. 30% of our overdoses in 2020 were 26 to 35 years old. What you don't see on here um, is 15 to 25, 21% of our overdoses in Queen Anne's County. So those numbers are extremely high and the percentages between, the 20, between 15 and 35 are very high with that. Heroin arrests on the Eastern Shore. This is by county, and this is for 2021. Looking at neighboring jurisdictions, Queen Anne's County has had four so far in 2022, 75 arrests for uh, heroin and opiates in uh, 2021. Comparing to our other counties, Worcester County, 86 and eight, Caroline County, 78 and 13 arrests. We're very aggressive towards making sure that we uh, charge drug dealers with that. I firmly believe that we do not, um, we should not incarcerate somebody who has an opioid issue. But I firmly believe they need to have treatment. But I firmly believe that if you are a drug dealer or a drug seller, that we are going to kick your door in and lock you up. And that's a very strong message that we, we try to demonstrate. This is personal to me, and I'll try to do my best to get through this. Um, a friend of mine lost his daughter several years ago. Good kid, every, like everyone's kid. Um, pictures of her at my house. Nice little girl. Um, she basically was, um, she, had a, she had an issue with probably different types of drugs and things like that, I guess. She um, died in a different jurisdiction, and that jurisdiction basically, this was probably in the era of, 19, of probably 2018, that jurisdiction basically uh, said, well, what do you want us to do? You're, daughter was a drug addict, and what'd you expect? This is what was said to the parents. And um, that's, not, that's the farthest from the truth. This is someone's kid. Um, with that being said, I vowed to make sure that us in law enforcement always took every case of every overdose very serious. We can't solve them all, but if you do, kill somebody in Queen Anne's County by giving them a drug, we are gonna hunt them down. We're gonna do everything we can. Um, I had a parent one time call me up and say, hey, you know, you need to back off of your messages on social media and stuff because some of the dealers in Queen Anne's County aren't selling to my daughter. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And she said that you're making my daughter go over to uh, other jurisdictions to buy their stuff because people feel that the sheriff's office is gonna come or state police or the drug task force is gonna come lock them up. Um, and we were jeopardizing her daughter by making her daughter go across the bridge. So that was an enabling issue with the parents. Um, but 
I vowed to my friend um, that I would always be there to make sure that we held drug dealers accountable. I think it's important. And that if I could have gotten to this young lady first, I would have made sure that she was able to or could have gotten into some type of treatment here or somewhere else. So that's the reason for my uh, passion for this. Incarceration, if you can go back, Lord, for a minute. I really believe that, like I said earlier, incarceration is not the answer. Um, offering assistance as a community is. And it doesn't have to be from the police locking somebody up. It can be from all of us coming together. Talked earlier about our, our partnering with our community members. This is an awesome partnership with you all today being here. And family seeking help. I had a family come into my office and sit down with me and they gave me every excuse in the world why they did not want their son arrested who had stolen under $100,000 from their family in cash by taking checks and, and cashing things and stealing things and all this. We have to, do, we have to stop enabling um, and allowing them to do this. And the family said to me, well, the reason why we don't want them to be charged is because we don't want their name to be in the newspaper or we don't want it to hurt their record of this. I know for a fact that if those steps would have been taken, things would, would be a lot different for that family. You know, um, the name in the newspaper, we're having a Maryland Judiciary case search, intervention and making a hard decision by the family is what was needed in this situation. Um, I truly, truly believe that with that case. Deputies on the street administer Narcan more than we can even fathom. We go through cases and cases of Narcan. Cases of Narcan. We've Narcan people uh, and had them run from us. I mean, they, they just, they wake up, they see the police, and they run. We've had um, deputies deploy two and three doses of Narcan on one person. We've had deputies Narcan at 6 p.m. and go back at 10 p.m., 11 p.m., Narcan again. Um, the deputies see a lot of that. It's a great tool. It's given to the public. One of the things that we see as a challenge is the YouTube dilemma, as I call it, is people that try to ingest a certain amount of a substance so that they can actually be revived. And if you look at that, it's one of the challenges we face is people trying to revive themselves or, or having their friends revive themselves uh, and, and then do a YouTube video about it with Narcan. So it is abused. Practice the education, I believe, is always most important. And being here today, it's awesome. The awareness as a community, making sure that everyone else that we know is aware of that. And lastly, the enforcement. And like I said, not for the person who has a substance abuse issue, unless they've stolen from you or me or somebody else, or done something wrong or killed somebody while they're driving while impaired. But just for the, um, the addiction, I think it's, you know, it's important to treat them with mental health, and it's important to treat them with whatever tools are out there other than an arrest. Because once they get arrested and they get immersed in jail, they learn all the tricks of the trade when they come out to be better at getting the next fix and better at uh, manipulation for the family. Lastly, the enforcement for the drug dealers is making sure that we do lock up anybody who is selling to any one of our community members or any one of our family members. As Mr. McKenna said earlier, they put profit way ahead of the care about your loved one. They do not care about our loved ones. How can you help Good Samaritan Law? If you see somebody that's overdosed, make the phone call, call 911. Activate the 911 system, give them CPR, give them Narcan, whatever you can. Stick around, I promise you we're not gonna lock you up. We're not gonna lock up somebody that is trying to help out. Community involvement, groups like this are very important. Partnerships, if you get a chance, if you wanna join the Drug Free Coalition, I guarantee we could use more members uh, for that. And then drug take back events. Get those pills off the street, get rid of those old narcotics that you have, 
anything you have laying around because somebody out there, whether it's somebody stopping in your house or somebody who wants to break in, somebody wants those pills that are in those containers. QAC goes purple. I'm sure this will be talked about later, but an awesome event, and it shouldn't just be for one month, it should be all year long as far as Queen Anne's County. It's a great partnership. It's an awesome way for us to help as a community fight the opioid epidemic. If you want to report anonymous drug activity or something like that, you can download our app. You can uh, send us an anonymous tip. Uh, we will act on it. Drug cases do take time, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, but every single one of them is followed up on and it takes a community to give us the information. The drug dealers, it's not like the old days where the guy's standing on the corner with the hoodie over his head. It's now social media, it's now network of friends, things like that. It's not like it used to be. So we need the input from the community. I wanted to give you something um, history-wise real quick before I drop off, but if you buy marijuana in a dispensary, it's between 40 and 60 bucks for a gram, for a dime bag. If you get it on the street, it's between 10 and 40. So the market is still out there for this stuff. Coke's still 100 bucks a gram. Crack right now is 200 bucks a gram. A cap of heroin, five to 10 bucks. That's it, it's cheap. A fold is a little bit more than that. A gram of heroin is $200. A grain, and I mean a grain, less than what you would ever even imagine, a grain of fentanyl. If we split that grain, it would kill all three of us, all four of us up here, if we split it in four ways. Less than one one ten thousandths of a cent for that grain of fentanyl. Coming into our country from China, being made in different labs over there. So it's important to think, you know, what people are getting out there is being cut with, with the fentanyl and all. So thank you all.